Yeah, so I was struggling with what to call this talk um, because, um, you know, it kind of promises a lot with the and beyond um, part, but, you know, I really kind of wanted to take some time. I hadn't talked about SaaS publicly in, in quite a while, honestly, actually, actually, and there's been a lot of really awesome new features that I think the majority of the community and users don't actually know about. Um, so if you're super up on everything in SaaS land, um, then actually, I, I really feel like uh, a lot of this stuff is going to be new for people. But maybe if you're really in the repos all the time, uh, you're aware of some of this. But I think there's going to be some really interesting stuff, especially if your company um, uses SaaS, which um, I think a lot of companies do now. All right. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Hampton Lundtord Catlin. Um, for my day job, I'm CEO of a new startup I just founded called Vue. Um, you can't find out all that much about it because there isn't a lot that we put up out there. Um, but you know, stay tuned in the, the future. I've got a lot to say there. Um, I also sort of on the side have uh, invented a lot of different technologies. Um, I yeah, created SaaS, uh, a language called Haml, um, one of the first mobile sites in the world, uh, m.wikipedia. So if you use Wikipedia on your phone, um, iPhone games, bunch of Ruby libraries, just all sorts of random stuff. I can't stop myself from just making new stuff. Um, but my actual job is in you know technical leadership. Um, so I was just most recently at Rent the Runway, uh, and I did a startup called uh, WordSet, and I was CTO of a company called MoveWeb that did a ton of mobile websites for a lot of really big companies. Um, and yeah, so that's about me. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history about what, like how SAS came to be as a language. Um, and if you use it today, you're probably not aware that it started as this, uh, as a sub project of a language called Haml that is a sort of very short, uh, white space sensitive, minimalist uh, way to write semantic HTML. Um, and Haml remains pretty popular in the Rails community. Um, it's pretty, it's gotten ported uh, to a lot of different languages, but um, SAS was its uh, kind of little sister and the original team, it was actually in the same repository for first two years of, of SAS existing. Um, but obviously it's, its younger sister has definitely grown up to be far bigger um, than its older brother. Um, and you know, the story you know starts in 2006 where I was running a small development shop and I worked with some really great CSS developers where at the time, I think it's important to kind of mention like there weren't preprocessors, like Babel wasn't a thing. Um, the idea that there was a process that happened to your JavaScript and CSS before it got to the browser, even just combining files wasn't popular in 2006. Uh, some companies had their own internal sort of solution for this, um, but you know, bundling, minimizing, there was a couple libraries that did that. Um, but the idea of actually having a build pipeline for your web assets didn't exist. So um, SAS was definitely the, the first technology. And actually, um, so when I first was, you know, promoting SAS, a lot of people thought it was for sort of dynamic themes. They thought it was going to replace CSS in the browser. There was actually going to be something like a JavaScript implementation of of the way the browser works. But we sort of took this like very strong design decision that it actually generates CSS and that we don't want to mess with CSS and it's a great standard or good enough standard. It's gotten much better over the years. Um, but that, you know, we want to leave it sort of as is and, and have our own. Um, and, you know, it's really important to, technically I, I did have the idea for this, but um, Natalie Weizenbaum, all credit for 99.99% of the amazingness that is in SAS. She has been working since 2006. So 2006, we were in RailsConf. Um, and uh, she was, uh, get this, 16, and came down and she'd been the main sort of person working on Hamill. And I grabbed her and we went to a conference room and I, we started, I kind of proposed my idea to do this for CSS and what it would look like. Um, and uh, by the time we were done with RailsConf, uh, she took a plane back home. And then by the time she landed, she'd written the original working prototype for SaaS. So, um, and Natalie works at Google now and is full-time working on 
um, SAS uh, as a language um, sponsored by basically Google for that. Um, so thanks, Google. Um, but uh, I also want to say, so it's not just Natalie, there's a, a core team of us. Um, then this is not even ex in, like totally everybody because this is just who kind of the leadership team for the language. Each of the sub projects has tons of maintainers and different people, but Gina, Miriam, Michael, myself, and obviously um, Natalie. Uh, so it takes a, a village. Um, and, you know, SAS, like I'll certainly say without Natalie, this language would not be as popular as it is. But we've also had to pivot a couple times um, in order to keep that true. Um, and so, you know, even originally SAS was like Camel, white space sensitive. Um, it mostly looked like CSS. We didn't go too crazy, but um, it was sort of, since it was a sub project, we wanted to do kind of Hamel for CSS. Um, and that's how it existed for quite a while. Um, and then we ended up moving over, um, you know, inspired by some of the competition and, and looking at what was happening uh, to a sort of CSS compatible version or a superset uh, syntax. Uh, some people get really confused um, with the language here because um, both these syntaxes are called SAS. Uh, the, we call one indented SAS, which is the original syntax. Um, and the ending is SCSS, but we don't tend to, it's the same parser, it's the same language. Um, and that is the primary style. So uh, it can be a little confusing, like what is SAS? Um, but to us, when we talk about SAS, we're actually talking about SCSS for the most part. Um, and, you know, the real unlock there was um, obviously the code I have on the right here is using mixins, but you know when you have a different syntax, if you work at a small company, even if it's pretty you know small team, you basically by putting in the old syntax, we're saying, hey, we're no longer writing CSS. You have to go learn. You have to go learn something, coworker. I changed our repo. If you do it so it's CSS compatible, you can basically install it in your repository, and your coworkers can use features at will if they want. They can not use a single feature if they want. Um, and so that like it makes it opt in uh, as a language. And that was just sort of a, a super um, game changer. Um, also, you know, SAS was originally written in, in Ruby, which is a language I, I still use. Um, and at the time, you know, we had only we were only had more to go. Sorry, we were in the Rails community. It was growing. There was uh, tons of people. Um, and, you know, I think <laughs> There's a lot of like obviously the the Ruby ecosystem isn't as large as it used to be. Um, it is still doing really well. And that's a whole other top topic. Um, but uh, it just you, you know strategically speaking, the fact that you only like our thing was written in Ruby. So if you were using PHP, it was very difficult to use SAS. And like specifically, if you wanted to use SAS, and a lot of people did in their PHP projects. Yeah, you're, you know, your developers, you're like, hey, can you configure your Ruby environment? Okay, it's a gem install. And they're like, what's a gem? And you're like, you know, it, it made it really difficult. Um, and, you know, shortly after, so it was 2012, um, when the project was only six years old, uh, less, here's 23% of the market. Um, it, had, it was over 50% of people who were using preprocessors and less was a, actually started as a Ruby project, funny enough, and it was supposed to be less complicated than SCSS. Um, and they pioneered a couple things. Uh, the, they were the first ones to do a CSS compatible syntax. And uh, also they originally were in Ruby for a short time and then the node ecosystem took off and they sort of took off with that. Um, and, you know, at that point, like, why wouldn't you just go use less? Like you, everybody had JavaScript and Node, even a, a Ruby developer will have that on their computer. So, um, and you know, I really dawned on me, like we knew the compatible thing, we, we could fix that. But you know, Node had taken off and their choice of implementing in JavaScript was was really um, smart because it just, it fit right in with the trend of, of everybody going to Node uh, around 2012, um, or that being the most popular sort of language. And obviously now like there isn't a web framework that's not using um, some sort of node-based compilation pipeline. Um, so we could have gone and re-implemented into JavaScript, but that didn't, to me, what I wanted was I was worried about speed and I wanted more portability. Um, so I, in a side project, not officially originally uh, approved by my uh, the rest of the team, uh, started a project called LibSAS 
um, uh, in 2012 uh, to basically mimic the Ruby library at the time um, and try to build a spec around how things function. Um, and one of the great parts about C um, is that it's fast and port sorry, C++, it's fast and portable. Um, so I knew we could get great compilation times. And then I knew you can embed C++ code into things and people never know that there's C++ code there. Um, and so for instance, uh, today, if you use Node SAS, which is uh, by far the most popular um, version of SAS or like SAS implementation, uh, that or SAS C Rails is, is the one that, that kind of replaced the original Ruby SAS. Both of those are actually wrappers around LibSAS. So a lot of people don't even know the name LibSAS, but Node SAS and SAS C Rails and all the variants. If you're using Python and you're using like PySAS, that one is wrapping LibSAS inside. So it's these guts that we could kind of go to every community. Um, and that was the sort of thing like, how do you beat going to the largest one, right? You try to go to every single one of them. Um, and, you know, I'll say like, I, that works, that that approach worked. LibSAS has made, um, I think is, you know, plus, I mean, obviously the the great work Natalie and team have done on designing the language and improving it over the years, but, um, you know, NodeSAS is sort of the standard now. Um, it's kind of crazy how quickly over the last six years that uh, I couldn't actually find, I need to go to a survey, I couldn't find a survey. Um, I was just, you know, comparing GitHub files, you know, where three, four, five, six times the, the number that less is. Um, and, you know, no hard, they, they pioneered a lot of great stuff. So that's not, you know, I, I don't consider any of this like negative competition. Um, and, uh, but yeah, like all these big companies are now using it, which is kind of crazy um, that, you know, the, but in 2012, like it looked like we were going to be, you know, I don't think if we'd made, I think if we stayed the course with just a Ruby implementation, we <laughs> I wouldn't be here giving this talk. Um, but there's some downsides with LibSAS. Um, C++ is a notoriously difficult language to code in. And the Venn diagram of people who care about CSS or CSS related projects and the Venn diagram of people who enjoy writing C++ is a very small overlap. It's specifically like three people. Um, and so there's very few, like we get a lot of contributions and a lot of the uh, side projects and stuff, but Node SAS uh, sorry, LibSAS is very hard and we've never actually had a corporate sponsor on it at all. So um, uh, Marcel Greeter and Michael Misfood and Aaron Leung, um, they plus some other people I'm sure missing, but like they've done just a lot of really hard work that's sort of <laughs> thankless about a project that you don't even know the name of because uh, it's actually behind the scenes. Um, and so, but you know, part of that, that it being a small team is like, the new features are just not coming. I mean, like it's, it is, there's a lot of edge cases that aren't covered. It's very difficult to solve all of them. Um, the language makes it more difficult. Um, and, you know, as such at the moment, like if you use node SAS, you're definitely not getting all of the new stuff, which I'll talk a little bit later about what, what your other options are. Um, so as much as it's been a success, it's almost a victim of our own success because it works. It's just the downsides of um, it being very hard to maintain. Um, and probably people in this, you're using it and if it works for you, it works for you. So don't listen to me, but let me, I'm going to talk about some of the new features now. Um, cause Dart SAS started in 2017 where Natalie, uh, worked full time on the Dart team, worked on their standard lib. Um, and she decided like, Hey, why am I writing in Ruby? We're not even like, nobody's using this implementation. So she went to her favorite language, which a plus, uh, was Dart and, um, you know, so Dart can target uh, JavaScript and many other um, uh, languages as a compile target. Um, and so sort of this is when Google sort of after about a year of this kind of took on building SAS in Dart as sort of an official project. Um, not owned by them though, so not like that. We still got it. And so this is kind of like the timeline of when we sort of like shut down Ruby um, development of LibSAS which came towards the end and then Dart has, is now the reference and implementation for new features. Um, and I'll point out uh, this folder, um, <laughs> that's me flipping to my actual browser. Um, these are not actual security vulnerabilities, it's just the website. Um, not the website, the compiler. Um, but we have proposals here, we now have like a formalized method for how we talk about changes. 
Um, so if you are a total SaaS nerd coming here, there's tons of interesting information on what people are thinking about, um, and especially the accepted um, I, stuff. I learn a ton in here, um, but I'm going to talk about um, some of the features that you might not be aware of and some of the polish that we've been having to do with the language. So when we first started, um, we wanted to add in math functions. So something like min, where given a list, um, fun fact, everything in SAS is technically a list, even a single value. So it's one of those languages. Um, so it's just a fun fact. You can use that at parties and stuff. People think it's very interesting. But uh, the, the min function takes a list and it'll pick the lowest value. And you know, we do this at preprocessor time. So the, that, the point of min, it's not, you, you've probably never used it unless you're crafting a library or you're auto generating something really fancy or looping or doing something really interesting. But, you know, we wanted to add these powers to the preprocessor. Um, and so, you know, here I have an example, given that padding 300, it's going to pick 20. We'll compile into 20 um, because min was a SAS function we put in place. Um, and then CSS added a min function. <laughs> Whoops. Um, you know, we, Natalie especially works really hard. We, we work with the W3C directly actually um, in the working groups. A lot of the um, Miriam's on a ton of the working groups um, and to make sure that the two are compatible because at this point it's, you know, a lot of <laughs> users basically. But, you know, they added min and as is the right, we were, in a namespace that we probably shouldn't have been in. Um, and, you know, this is a question I get all the time, which is like, hey, CSS added variables and calculations. You know, does this supplant something like SAS? Um, and the answer is no, um, because they are subtle but different things. So, uh, SAS is good when you want to generate CSS. That's what we're doing. Um, the existence of variables in CSS is, and, and especially the min function they're fundamentally a little different because the min function in CSS is never resolved for you. It's live calculated. You're actually, when you put min, you're putting in a rule. Um, you're not doing an imperative statement to actually do something right then. Um, so SAS is before you get to the browser and they're very well, maybe you might even use min inside of a, a SAS min function inside of a, a CSS min function. That's possible. I, don't know what you're doing, but uh, you might actually want to kind of generate out some min values for some different classes or something like that. Um, and that's totally valid. Um, CSS functions are actually supposed to be continuously evaluated. Um, they're really much more like rule sets than sort of a calculation that you're asking. Um, so like, for instance, we have this example, I, I kind of expanded out the original one. The first one uh, margin, uh, we're doing the minimum of 20 pixels and 300 pixels. Honestly, obviously this one isn't a good real life example, but I'm gonna show you what, how SAS thinks about this and how we've had to have like a little bit of a dance with how uh, CSS works. Um, but um, sorry, the second line is saying the minimum of 20 pixels or a variable that I have that's 300 pixels. And then the third one is actually something you might wanna do in CSS, which actually shows off what the power of min is in CSS syntax, which is that I'm saying, take 20% of the total height of the page. And if that is that smaller than the current 20 pixels. Um, so that will never let it get bigger than 20 pixels. I don't know why you do that, but um, like if you were really small, it goes smaller. Um, and so it was really great for responsive designs, VH and men um, and CSS. You can do some really great responsive fluid designs. Um, but the intention there is a little different. And that last one, padding, is, like I said, the only one that I think is sort of what the whole point of this CSS min function. It's not supposed to be a, a preprocessor or something that you know the answer to. So that first one is a great example of uh, there's no reason to really do that. Um, you should just put 20 pixels. Um, and then, so the output of this is actually, um, this is Dart SAS's output. Um, the, the first line we actually just leave alone because you didn't use anything dynamic in there. And so we say, if you don't want anything dynamic, you're clearly not trying to use SAS. Now it doesn't make a ton of sense, but we just leave it be. The second one, we see that you're using padding and uh, there are ways to escape it. So this wouldn't happen. But if you use that variable just raw, we assume, okay, you're actually wanting to do math here. You're asking me to do math. Um, and then in the third example, obviously there's no variables, but we figured out that that is actually um, a 
CSS function that you're looking for because you're using mixed units is a really good sign because we can't do a pre-process or math. Actually, if you want to get, if, if you're a good SAS nerd, you really want to, like reading the stuff around units is, you know, mind-bendingly complicated, which are actual fixed units, which are relative and how we can actually deal with them. Um, color math too uh, gets really, really complicated, um, but we hope you don't have to think about it. Uh, I tried to use this example to compile it uh, on CodePen, um, but you'll see libsass, I believe is what Chris is using behind the scenes. And it actually won't let you use the proper CSS min function, uh, which isn't good. And a great example of why we're kind of encouraging people and like, you know, this is, I'm sure in the backlog of stuff that our volunteers are doing their best to do, uh, their best to fix. Um, yeah, the line should be perfectly valid, but it breaks. Um, so buyer beware. Okay, let's talk about new features that, you know, because I want to set like a little backdrop on a lot of the work. A lot of those rules are around some of the subtleties here and trying to get good backwards compatibility. Um, but uh, to kick off sort of the biggest thing I'm talking about, yeah, people want import once. So uh, that has been, it was in something that was in a um, library called Compass that was very popular early in SAS, SAS's life, but doesn't exist in any of the new implementations and Compass has been long deprecated. But, you know, the, the problem is basically that import, we overrode the meaning of it. Um, we make some guesses around what you mean when you say at import. Um, and it's basically what I'm, I'm going to call it a textual include. So you could copy and paste the files every time you see an import until it's just one giant file. And then we kind of compile on that. Um, so order really matters and you absolutely can do it twice. <laughs> so here, um, if I were to import margins in both my header and footer file, I will end up with duplicated uh, CSS output if margins is, is generating CSS. Um, and like this, doesn't happen a ton, a ton, but you know, it's something that people are just like, Hey, look, I definitely only want this once. Like it's a header. I only want it once. Like help me out. Um, and you know, <laughs> Natalie, uh, there's a thread of an open issue that had been open for, I mean, my gosh, seven years, um, of us just saying, we're not going to put in that feature. Um, and it's because we've been working on and Natalie have been working on designing a module system because import once while it's kind of a hack, it, the order of inclusion starts to matter where things are placed and then we need deterministic rules on when all this happens and it's just part of a bigger design problem that we were facing um and so uh let me talk about how we solved it um because i am thrilled i think this is natalie's design and i think it's one of the best module systems out there so um yeah imports since they're textual um and this is probably the way a lot of your code works out there um is that the colors, like you would import variables first, files with variables or settings or mixins, and then you kind of get to your files that are actually producing content. And you can see here that footer is actually, um, do I can do a pointer, that's kind of cool. Um, primary is from here, goes up through the include and then comes back down. So if you want to figure out where primary is, it could be very difficult and there might be multiple files. If, if another import happened somewhere in between that used primary, set a variable called primary, it's a global scope. So you could have all sorts of terrible side effects. Um, and, you know, usually we, we solve this by using, you know, variable names that are longer or harder to, to guess or scope somehow. Um, but you know, this makes optimization very difficult too, because every time I'm evaluating footer, I actually need to keep in memory every single variable and mix in that has ever been seen in the project. So for very large projects, this means optimization can be very difficult because we have to evaluate as if it is all in one place where it's much easier to evaluate, hey, I know what I need to know and I can just focus on that. Um, so let's talk about the modules. Um, so here's a, an example. So I make a file called color scss. Um, we automatically, you can always start with an underscore and we'll automatically, you can reference it that way to say that this is a file that I'm not intending to have textual output. Um, and then here in footer, we say at use color. Now that does a couple things. Um, I'll note it, if there was textual content, it functions as an import once. Um, but what it also does is any variables or um, mixins inside of that file are brought in under a prefix. 
So I have declared that I want color to come in. I'm going to use color and then color dot primary um, is automatically there. Um, and I personally love this because my code, I feel like it's so much more readable like this, where before all my things would be dollar sign color primary or primary dash color. Um, but now there's sort of like nice textual elements to it. Um, also, if you use a good editor, the autocomplete will work perfect. Um, and it's very easy for IDEs to know what color has in it. Um, so you don't have to go open the file yourself. It'll autocomplete. Um, and so like, but just here's an example of the structure is that, you know, index would use footer um, instead of import. And this, because this isn't exporting anything, this has no side effects, but it will actually include the body here. Um, and then, oh, I, <laughs> I've got to put a use here. They should say at use color, and then I can use primary. So it, you're actually referencing back to files, um, but since they don't have side effects, that's okay. And actually as much, as much better for our, our memory use. Um, and here's a couple other ways to use that use function. Um, you can put use as palette, for instance, and then that overrides the automatic naming. So if you don't want to call it color in your particular file, or if you have a lot of code in there, you can say as palette. This is very similar to um, ES6 imports if, you know, if you're used to JavaScript. Um, there's also use as star. And what that'll do is that will populate your kind of global namespace temporarily, but only for this file, because you're saying, hey, I want to bring this thing in. Like, let me, like, I'm bringing it in. But I'm doing this on purpose. So this you can, for backwards compatibility, um, if you don't want to change your code at all and change your variable names, um, this will make it so you can basically import on any file. Um, and this will functionally kind of act like before. So if you had dollar sign color dash primary, um, this will work just fine. Um, but we don't really like, this is definitely how I and the team think you should be probably writing your code. Um, so it's a little more logical and, and semantic in its naming. Um, so here's, a, oh yeah, this is an example from Vue, my company. Uh, we, we use SAS, surprise. Um, uh, you, if you're CSS experts out there, I'm sure you're all judging me. I'm sure I did something horrible here, but um, this is, I have a font file and a color file. And so font is Nanito and the colors, I have all the auto prefixes. So this is just what our layout, uh, or I think it's the global file, um, what it does to set some standards. So like this, we're, it's used in production um, all over the place. Um, and yeah, it's just to mention it, it is basically also import once. Uh, so you got you got your import once. Um, we talk a little bit about forward, which is something else. It's a little more edge casey, but it's a, a nice superpower that we added in. Um, forward will, uh, when your file uses forward, anybody who uses your file um, will get value sent to them. So for instance, like let's say I just have one big utils file and I don't like to handle imports for some reason, or maybe this is a library. There's a lot of these are very useful for libraries. Um, and if I forward color, that means anytime anybody uses utils, then they'll get utils.primary um, because that was from our original uh, color file. Um, so sort of utils is getting all these features forwarded on it, or sorry, forwarded on to the next um, caller. Uh, and I, if you, I don't love that pattern. Um, I personally am not as convinced. Uh, I'm sure there's some good use cases, uh, but I'm gonna say, if you want to do this and make one utils, use this feature. There's an auto prefix feature. So you can say forward color as color star. And this will basically make every variable and mix in that came from that original color, um, sorry, color module, it'll prefix it. So at least you're not just having like primary and the namings kind of get off. At least that's a little nicer then. So I highly recommend that. Um, and uh, also I'm gonna mention use with, we have a with argument that's possible on use. It's also possible in forward. Um, I think, in, I don't know if that's released yet, but it was recently um, sort of, approved is uh, one of the specs, but here's how it works. So this is totally contrived. You should never do this in production, but once again, good for libraries. Um, I set a value here for color and I say color and get it from the, my colors file. So I'm, there's a button in SCSS file. And then I annotate it with this default note on the end. Um, 
By doing that, I'm basically declaring an API. I'm saying this button module, you can override color if you like color. Um, and so here I use that variable. So we're sort of building the ability to customize something in this module. Um, so this is how you would use that. Um, use button with and then color blue. So now what will happen is this file right here will actually generate CSS with the color blue. Um, now, super big note here. This, what I just wrote with button, uh, would be much better as a mix-in. Uh, the downside with this, and why I said it's only really for libraries or backwards compatibility, um, is like, sorry, because there was a lot of libraries that have you set variables ahead of time. Um, but uh, you can only call this once. So if you want more than just the color blue, like you're out of luck. You can't do a red after this because this is import once based, you know, functionally. And this isn't meant to be called over and over. Mixins will do that for you. We've had them forever. Go learn about mixins if you don't know about mixins. That's something you can do to sort of just grab um, some of these values and override them or, or do custom functions. So custom selectors. Uh, so that's definitely the better approach. But here, it's just to demonstrate the idea that if you're thinking about a theming or like, let's think a library, like what if this was actually a button library I was building um, and I might change the total width and I want that on every button ever and it's a full thematic change that I really truly want everywhere. That's when this stuff is really super useful and very powerful because, you know, unlike before, it was sort of implicit with the variable global scope that you were overwriting certain things and that's just not very scalable. And here you can be really clear about what your library makes available. Um, once again, I mean, there's so much more going on, especially if you're into colors um, and, and figure out a lot of those edge cases with the new features coming out in CSS to make sure that dance continues. Um, there's just absolutely a ton to learn. Um, and, you know, sort of the question of like, what's next? And I've sort of been alluding to this. I mean, obviously there's just continuing to polish the language, but um, the features are that I just talked about, um, and the well thought through way that it reacts to some of those edge cases are only really covered in Dart SAS. Um, obviously, if you're using something in the Dart ecosystem, you're probably already using this because it's the easier way to do things. Um, but most of us, and I think most of the industry at this point are sort of using a Node.js, uh, Webpack based build, maybe Grunt, maybe something else, but like you're kind of in the <clears throat> NPM uh, universe um, and like, the issue, it is, Dart test is available to node people. So actually, I'm just going to skip to this. If in your package.json file, you have node SAS, you can just delete the word node and just put in SAS and you will get a version that has all the features I just talked about. The downside is it's a compilation of the Dart code into JavaScript and it is not as efficient it is slower than, so Node SAS is actually slower than Dart SAS. Dart SAS natively compiled is faster than Node SAS and has all the nice features. Uh, so good work, Dart. Um, but when you transpile Dart into, I don't know who started this transpiler thing, when you transpile Dart into JavaScript, uh, the performance comes down a lot, like significantly, about five times slower um, based on some recent tests I saw. Um, we are going to address that. Uh, Dart has added on a lot of features to make it embeddable, just like how C++ is embeddable. Um, so we will be moving to an embedded Dart um, sort of based version. And if you have a very large, like here's the way you should make the decision for your, your particular thing. Um, if you have a very large single CSS you know, output file, so you're just throwing a ton of stuff in, um, it, it takes a while to compile as is. Uh, I would not recommend changing to Dart SAS. Uh, you're gonna have to wait for those features. Um, if you're using SAS, like where, you know, like let's say React components, you can just put a SCSS file next to your, you know, you like import it in your component or whatever using JavaScript it imports and like they're relatively granular. Uh, you should probably upgrade in a simple small refactor even if it was slow, it might speed it up because we can compile single files very quickly. Um, the only thing that's really slow is the very large at imports everywhere project. So um, yeah, if your compile time is you know around 10 seconds right now or six seconds um, after every change, 
probably a problem. Um, but once again, if it's a relatively small project, we're using it at view. We don't have that much, maybe like 20,000 lines of code, something like that. And I, I don't even notice the, I mean, I've, I've never noticed it was compiling, um, just reloads with Webpack. Um, so, you know, and I, I think the trade-offs on our code organization and how we're able to do things uh, is, is just well, well worth it. Um, but yeah, it's as simple as a quick uh, package change. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's the, the end of, of, of my slides. Um, we've got 10 minutes left and I'm happy to answer uh, questions if people have them. Um, would you recommend the upgrade for custom theme material design project? Um, I, wait, answer a lot. Oh, hey. Um, oh, oh, it gives you audio, doesn't it? Um, do you mean just based off the, the like GitHub, or sorry, the, the Google project? Claire. Um, I mean, I guess I'm gonna say I'm not actually the answer. I'm not the expert on material design or how they're using SCSS, to be honest. Um, but that's my, my answer is I'm not the expert on that one, sorry. I'd love to know the answer. I'm gonna count that as answered. I plead the fifth. Um, any other questions? You can ask me about anything. Favorite restaurant. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna, actually, I'm, I'm gonna end with one note at the end, uh, which is normally a question I get, so I was uh, getting ready for it, um, which people always wanna know about post CSS. Um, post CSS, if you don't know, is a JavaScript based sort of post processor for CSS and its name. Um, it's got a good name for that. Uh, it is very quick and very powerful. It has lots of, um, and we'll answer that one in a second. Uh, it has lots of cool features and you can add in SAS like features as sort of, you can add on and jam on whatever you want. Honestly, it's like a Lego bricks. Um, and like, we don't have, we, <laughs> for some reason, CS, post CSS seems to have a beef with us. We have no beef with it. It's great for prefixing. Like SAS is not built for, you know, prefixing everything. Um, like it, it has lots of things that it's really good at. Like, backwards compatibility, a couple other things. Um, and so, you know, I use both, to be honest, um, but we really consider SAS a language and we we think every little different, like the the having a common language that everybody uses and had a lot of compatibility has value in itself. Um, and yeah, as Taryn just said, yeah, I mean, so do I. So we, I, there's no, there's no beef from our side. Like we think it's a really cool tech, um, but it's not, it isn't a language. Um, What's our latest quarantine hobby? Uh, ooh, latest. I was playing Universal Paperclips, uh, which is an online game. Um, and you should check it out. Uh, yeah, it's like free and it's very addicting. Um, what, what's a SaaS feature that, that people don't know about as much as they could? I think color math. That's one that's been there forever. And I'm in I, I remain in love with it because you can do, there's so many powerful things that you can do with, with colors. Um, and we have an extremely sophisticated internal engine for dealing with color. Um, and I mean, I also just think like people generally don't use, the new units in CSS are very powerful, um, like VH and some of those. And um, I think most projects I've seen, people just tend to use pixels and then maybe a rem here or there. Um, but there's some really cool things out there that um, are, are good. Jennifer Fu, what about style components? I like style components. Um, I think, you know, it's, there's obviously like the React universe, there's sort of the web component stuff that's going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I for, I mean, I would say maybe it's based on the ecosystem you're in. I definitely have projects where I did not use SAS at all. And I just like put inline styles basically like into, into React stuff and like, it's fine. Um, I don't know, like, if you're really doing strict component stuff and you're already going down the rabbit hole and like you don't want to use sophisticated styling, I feel like styled components starts to, I have trouble when it gets complex. So like in, in Vue right now, we're doing some really interesting stuff in the browser with how like using cutting edge CSS features and stuff like that. And for some reason to me, components like 
kind of ignores the fact that you're in a wider universe of interactions like Flexbox and other things and you're flipping between files. And so, you know, I think there is some like truth that I think for this, like for this project, I'm, I'm back to using SAS again for those reasons. Um, but like, I don't think that there's anything like if you're doing relatively straightforward styling and you're not really trying to like do anything too complicated, like just style in line or, and I actually don't know what you mean styled components because there's, there's like three different versions that I'm aware of of styled components that all kind of call themselves that. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them and I think my answer to all of them is pretty much the same. Um, yeah. Well, ooh, what inspires me? I'm, I, I know that I'm supposed to say a person or <laughs> something. Uh, I, I get inspiration when I see an opportunity to help somebody. Um, and when I have the opportunity to like improve something structural or like something that's just kind of not ideal. And like that just is my thing that like I'll get so excited if I see an opportunity for something that nobody else is thinking. Um, and so I kind of get like, it, that's a meta answer versus like, you know, the children, um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a concept. Hampton, you have about four minutes remaining. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, pre I'm, I'm pretty much good unless other people. Uh, follow me on Twitter at hcatlin. Um, if you go to view live, V-E-U-E live.com, um, you can sign up for when we're doing our live tests coming up soon. Um, and it's going to be fun. It's basically kind of like Twitch, but for everybody else. And uh, I mean, that goes into the inspiring. I love all, I love creators. Like I just, I, I think they're so cool. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not the best at CSS. Like I'm not, I'm all right. But like, you know, I, I don't know everything about it. Like there's Miriam and Natalie know way more than me. Um, and uh, it's good to meet you too, Maria. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, I love that there are people who are fantastic at this stuff and they make beautiful designs and they make beautiful things happen and they give people experiences across the world. That I just, I love that. Um, all right, well, uh, thank you everybody. Like I said, I'm at H Catlin. Um, view, check it out, SAS, check it out, go to that repo. It's got cool stuff and uh, stay safe.